So what is going to happen to buyer sentiments after the circuit breaker is over for Singapore? Will buyers wait and see? Or will buyers come into the market to buy straight away? What are the key things and what's so unique about investment? <laughs> what are some of the pros and some of the cons? Should I buy a new development or a resale one? Now the circuit breaker as mentioned in the previous video in our R series is like a blackout period for Singapore now with this two to three months being shaved off the calendar with little economic activity for most small to medium businesses as well as large companies, players. This has caused a lot of predictions of what is going to happen to the property market because viewings also technically cannot take place especially for the resale market. As we all understand from previous timelines and events, Black Swan events like the 2008 Lehman Brothers and the 2003 SARS period has impact on the property market in Singapore and around the world. And property market also has a lagging effect from the economy and stock market behaviors. Now the main draw comes from the fact that any immediate impact is usually seen in these areas. Now when an event happens, in this case a pandemic, this global situation causes impact to the many industries and changes the way that we do business now and in future. So there are also going to be a lot of new markets that arise after such events due to newer opportunities. But coming back to the property market in Singapore, the lagging effect that we think is going to happen is caused by the fact that when certain industries get hit Core businesses firstly gets a short lagging effect to feel that business is not going to be the way that it used to be and there could be a drop in business, there could be a drop in economic activities and then the secondary businesses that supports the core businesses starts to feel the lagging effect as well. For example, tourism gets hit because every country now closes their borders. Airlines being the core of the tourism industry first feel the effect firsthand. Their yearly projection then gets a hit unemployment probably will kick in for that sector and then the secondary businesses that supports the airline business then feels the lagging effect a couple of months or a couple of quarters down the road. For example, travel agencies being in the secondary businesses, food preparation companies that prepares meals for airline passengers, so on and so forth. So the secondary businesses feels the lagging effect a while later and then it spills over to the third tier and the fourth tier businesses as well. Similarly, what happens in the property market does have a similar lagging effect. Now, because Singapore is well connected to the rest of the world in terms of its investment of its properties and being welcomed by a lot of foreign buyers and also investments in Singapore, which is why we have a lot of MNCs as well, any global impact will have impact on our local market. Now, the biggest drawback is that if unemployment happens at an alarming rate, the buying power or purchasing power in short will reduce and the perception of buying power will reduce as well. So we're talking about two things, actual buying power reduction and the perception of other people's buying power. So the perception and the actual thing causes a combination of effect to the property market. And so people who are affected by unemployment will naturally want to stay status quo or, and see how things turn out for their jobs, whether are they going to to be able to get new jobs as well and people who have dual income from both the husband and wife will probably take a step back in property investing especially with the rise of the sell one buy two concept and um, this group of people if one spouse loses a job they might probably take a step back in property investing some people might want to stay put or downgrade if they are facing issues with their monthly installment because of any form of job losses and of course we are factoring the fact that um, probably after the relief measure at the end of 2020 uh, comes to a stop. And of course, if the government would extend the relief measure in terms of the money mortgage payment, then that would definitely be a great beneficial help to uh, people who have lost their jobs as well. Third thing is interest rates. Now, this is however a safe haven now. And because of the fact that Cyborg is at an all-time low, which means that the holding cost has significantly reduced and a lot of people have refinanced to lower interest rates recently. And Singapore has always been favored for lower borrowing and leveraging rates for mortgage loans in recent years compared to its neighboring countries. So in terms of interest rates for mortgage, we are not too concerned because if it maintains at the current 1 over percent to 2 percent level, that is considered one of the lowest in the entire world. But the biggest implication will be this. 
a perception of where the property market will be going and whether or not will developers reduce their launch prices. Now, stock market is in summary a prediction and perception of what people's sentiments are. And similarly, when it comes to buying a property, what is reported in the media, negative news that is being portrayed on newspapers, all plays a part in everybody's mind. Now, if I want to buy a property, my friends and family will probably tell me, hey, what do you want to buy now? Why don't you just wait? Why? Because the news says so. The news says that the property is going to come down by a couple of percentage for the entire 2020 or 2021. However, such news are always very easily forgotten when the market takes the other direction. Just like what happened in April 2009 when the property market took a V-shaped recovery from the October 2008 Lehman Brothers crisis and many buyers trusting in what the predictions of various medias wrote were priced out of the market eventually because the Lehman Brothers crisis only lasted for about 6 to 9 months in the Singapore property market. Plus perception I think is the biggest implicator. Just like when you see crowds at show flats reported on the front page of the news articles, you will naturally feel like joining in and buying a piece of the pie. This is the effect of the social proof principle. Or you can call it the group polarization effect, meaning that if many people are doing it, most of the time, we as human beings will think that, hey, it should be safe for me to do it as well. So if people are buying, then it could be safe that I join in the crowd and I buy it as well. So what I think the biggest implicator will be what the news and media are reporting relating to the Singapore property market and what are the masses doing. But there again, both the news and the masses depends on one another. If the news reports that a lot of people are buying, then a lot of people will then react to that news and more people will come out to buy. There are actually a lot of people that is waiting a at the sidelines adopting a wait and see approach right now but they are really monitoring and when they say that they are monitoring how the market moves they are technically saying that they are waiting on what the news is going to report and of course the other influence would then comes from the so-called experts plus analysts which also have a lot of influence on what the news and media are reporting so what should we do if i'm a buyer that's planning to buy or if i'm a seller that's planning to move or to upgrade or to downgrade what should we be doing Let's take a look at the possible things that could happen. I think it's important to understand the fundamentals and what is underlying to have a better perspective. Meaning, if you are planning to adopt a wait and see approach, it will be beneficial to understand where Singapore is positioned in right now. Now, there will always be three scenarios no matter which position that we take. The market either says flat, the market is forced, or the market rises. And no matter which position we adopt, will always only be 33% correct eventually and 66% incorrect. So why don't we have a look at some of the fundamentals and probably that could help us in our decision making on what our next move should be whether I'm a buyer or a seller. Singapore is considered to be a safe haven when it comes to properties and setting up businesses. As mentioned in our previous video where we talk about why Singapore is different, you can click on the link right here. Now because of the fact that our government is firstly stable and because of the strong administration that we have, a lot of foreign investors have great confidence in in Singapore and they love to buy our properties. We also have very low company tax rates and personal tax rates plus the fact that we are very open to having foreign businesses set up shop here in Singapore. And thus, because we are a safe country, we attract a lot of interest. And not forgetting the fact that our land size is very, very limited. Secondly, we have cooling measures built in. How many? Let's have a look. We have quite a lot of cooling measures built in right now. And I think these are like so-called pistons that can be removed should there be a need to remove them or to tweak them to resuscitate the market should the market take a downward direction. For example, if the prices were to come down too fast and too drastically because of the spilling effects of the pandemic from around the global region, the government can tweak the ABSD level for Singaporeans or even foreigners and PRs to help developers and resale sellers create more buying interest. And we also have a lot of cooling measures relating to the seller stamp duty, LTV ratios, and stuff like that. We have a government that is taking very close watch on the market. Now, for example, there was this article being published on this particular date, and look at what the government published the next day to help the property market. 
And of course, fourthly, we now have a government that is subsidizing a lot of small to medium businesses. And a lot of countries are envying us because nevertheless, there will be sacrifices needed to be made by everybody in a pandemic situation like this. For example, your employer could be suffering right now for a loss of revenue because of the circuit breaker where they will have continuous fixed overheads like their rentals, their manpower costing. Although there are 75% subsidy for local employees up to a cap salary. But you on the other hand, as an employee, you're working from home, you could also be caught in a buy and sell kind of situation. Probably you have already sold your place, you have bought a property, but you cannot do renovation now because everything is now in the standstill. And thus, you might have incurred additional rental costs uh, because you're renting or you're renting back from your buyer. And thus, you are sacrificing extra costs as well during this circuit breaker period. But not only you, the spillover effect is that your renovation ID firm could also be suffering from a loss of income because the ID business has no revenue because their project is now delayed, their workers are stuck, they cannot start work, and the contractors helping the ID firms could also be suffering from a loss of income because they cannot do anything right now. So a lot of chain effect is happening, a lot of people have sacrifices to make. But nevertheless, it is how much this impact is being passed down to the consumer level and how much does it affect the perception of wealth and the perception of buying power. Number five, we also need to understand this fundamental in Singapore that we have a lot of people owning properties for their own state because Singapore has one of the highest home ownership rates in the world. And we also have CPF funds that most Singaporeans use to finance their monthly installments and their property down payments. So number five is to understand the psychology and thinking behind current homeowners. Now most Singaporeans own their properties for own stay and 70 over percent owns HDB properties. This amount of percentage own private apartments and this amount of percentage own landed properties. Now, if the huge majority of us are staying in our own state property and if most people's jobs are okay, unemployment rates are not rising to an alarming rate, will we panic to sell our properties? I don't think so because if people's jobs are not impacted, properties don't have to be in a fire sale kind of mode, then technically it's very hard to see fire sale deals in the market and it's very hard to see good deals in the market because this kind of deals exist if there's a panic selling mode or if a lot of people has job losses and they want to quickly sell off their properties. And even if one person in a household loses a job, the other spouse is still working, the other spouse still has uh, monthly income and CPF coming in and most households have spare CPF funds in their ordinary accounts to sustain the monthly installment for a certain period. And this can help people to last for probably up to a year or more even after the relief measures ends in 2020 December. And by that time, when the economy recovers, the spouse that have lost the job previously could have already found a new job or new employment. And point number six is that there, are, there is now an extension to developers by the government. And point number seven is that there's also extension given to Singaporean married couples up to 12 months instead of three months if they have bought a second residential property and they will now have a total of one year instead of six months to sell their first residential property in order to get a remission of the additional buyer stamp duty. You can read more about this news down at this link down below. And so now that we have a good look at the fundamentals of some of the important things to understand about Singapore residential property market, let's have a look at what could be the behavior of buyers and sellers after the circuit breaker is over.